pastor uh, as of next year. I have been preaching uh, during the month of December as a rule on Christmas and the things of Christmas. And, you know, you, you could talk about the wise men and how they found Jesus when he was probably the age two, three years old. He was not at the stable. Again, please, if you see wise men at a stable, at a nativity, knock them over or throw them behind the stable. They don't belong there. They didn't show up till two or three years later. Uh, I could talk to you about Herod. Herod was a madman. He was uh, the leader there uh, in Jerusalem. And Herod uh, had, had killed his, I don't know if y'all know this about Herod, but he, he uh, had his wife murdered because he was afraid she was going to try to usurp authority and take his king kingship. Uh, he had his son murdered for the same reason, had his mother-in-law murdered. Uh, it's said that he had around 100 people taken out for fear that they would take his place uh, from the time 40 to the age 70. By the age 70, Herod was a man who was uh, consumed with, with disease and the wise men. Men. When they came into town, probably came with an entourage, and because of that, there was a disturbance in the city that somebody had come there, and he invited them in and found out they, they were hunting for the Christ child. And doing so, he had one more one, one more that he needed to kill to make sure that his throne was not taken. That's why we have the murder of babies from three years and down in Bethlehem, three years and down. Amen. All the young males were murdered because of this madman. This is a violent time that when Jesus showed up. There's so many things that I could preach about and talk about. The impossibility that happened between Mary and Elizabeth. When Elizabeth was barren and was pregnant, then Mary showed up and she's a virgin. She's, those are two impossibilities. One's barren, one's a virgin. Both got babies. Amen. When they showed up, their babies, both babies jumped. That's why I say every now and then you get around somebody and they make you baby jump. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. You just baby just jumps. There's an excitement about that. Could preach about that this morning. Or Simeon and Anna in the temple on the eighth day. How Simeon said he had to see the, uh, the Christ child before he died. How Anna held him up. We could tell of the shepherds hearing a message and running. Amen. When they heard glory to God in the highest on earth. Oh, you could talk about Joseph. Stepdad Joseph had five dreams. All five were to keep Mary and to go to a particular place at a particular time, God visited him in dreams. Often when I meet with our staff on, in the mornings, I will tell them of a dream I had. I, my dreams are so colorful, and I never know which ones are, are real or which ones were just from pepperoni pizza. But either way, Joseph had five dreams. Bethlehem, the town that nobody noticed. There was no room in the inn. I could talk about the names of Christ. The Old Testament in Isaiah said his name would be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. Each one is a message. You, you could be picturesque this morning and talk about the sights and the scene and the smells of the story there at the stable. We could be sentimental and talk about the struggles of Joseph and Mary. And how during the time of taxation, it was God. The Scripture says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. In other words, the time was just right. It didn't seem just right. You're eight, eight months and three weeks pregnant, and now you've got to take a long trip to Bethlehem for taxation? Didn't look like the right time. The Romans were running the Jews. Didn't look like the right time. Everything that could go wrong looked like it was going wrong. Didn't look like the right time. You realize in your own life that when it doesn't look like the right time, to God it is. And he could show up right in the middle of your mess and make you a message. Mm, come on, Jesus. We can be spiritual and talk about what is going on behind the scenes of Christmas. I choose my favorite. My favorite is the incarnation. The incarnation. I heard about tarnation when I was a kid. But I never heard about incarnation. Nobody ever talked to me about that. It's the union of divinity, God, and humanity, man. If you think about it, all the elements of the Christmas worldview are in the Christmas story. And again, I'm going to tell you, this is my favorite message. So let me just preach my favorite message about Christmas. Is that all right? Amen. When you look at the Christmas story, because the coming of Christ changed history, literally from B.C. to A.D., we aren't straining things to say everything is different now that Jesus has come to the world. This isn't a sentimental thought, the, you know, about like the little drummer boy or I'll be home for Christmas. The coming of Christ establishes the truth of all that we believe, seen in its proper context, that Christ's birth speaks with incredible relevance to our 21st century people who write off Christmas. Many will write it off. They'll Xmas 
Christmas thinking they got rid of it. But X in the, in the Greek language is actually the word for Christ. So when you put X must, you just said Christ must. Amen. So don't try to X him out. You can't get rid of him. Can I get an amen? Isaiah seven fourteen says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. Now, if this word went out, if that verse went out the week before Jesus showed up, you'd be amazed. But this verse went out some 700 years before Jesus showed up. So they knew something was got to happen here. But first, we got to look for a virgin. Amen. We got to find one. So it's important. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is a sign. The virgin will be with child. She'll give birth to a son. And we'll call his name Emmanuel. Now, don't miss this because Emmanuel means God with us or with us is God. Amen. That God is literally going to show up here on this planet and be with us. Are you comfortable? Hebrews chapter 2. Bubba, good to have you in the house, sir. Amen. Recognize you. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. But one in a certain place testifies, saying, what is man? What is man? So here's the writer of Hebrews, who we believe is Paul, and he's saying somewhere it's written. I'm glad Paul said somewhere it's written because there are times I'm preaching, and I go, I don't know where it's at, but it's somewhere in the book. So what, I, what he was saying was in the book of Psalm chapter 8 is what he's talking about. I look it up for him. But he said somewhere. Somewhere in the Bible it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visited him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did, did set him over the works of your hands. You put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see, not yet all things put under him. In other words, we still got some stuff to deal with. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons, many sons, now don't get all gender jacked on me. Amen, all right? Because we got in a gender jack world right now. When he says sons, he include you ladies too. Come on, give me an Amen. Amen. So he says here, for it became him for all things, by whom are all things, and bringing many sons into glory to make the, cap make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Why us? Everybody say, why us? Say it again. So now we're going to go to where Paul was talking about. It's in the book of Psalm chapter 8. I'll start in verse 3 while you're looking it up or look up here on the, on the, on the screen. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, it's David talking now which thou hast ordained. What is man that you're mindful of him? That's the same thing what Paul said. And the son of man that you visited him, for you've made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You, you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet and all sheep, oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air. Fowl's another word for birds. Fish of the sea. And whatsoever pass through the paths of the seas, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Whew. So here's a confirmation from Psalms, the Hebrews, about Christmas. See, yes, yeah, I don't sound like Christmas. I don't see no trees and tinkling lights. and this. this is Christmas. When he came from heaven to earth, wrapped himself in flesh, put on an earth suit, and hung out with us. Father, I love you. Thank you for your word. Anoint my lips to share our hearts. Let our hearts be open today. Let us receive and grasp and get hold of this revelation in Jesus' name. And everyone shout, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I believe in all my heart that as a father, God created us for greatness. And we have made a mess of it. I mean, we messed it up. And as parents and grandparents, you know that. At times, you, you got children grandkids. You think, now, I wanted them for greatness. And they made a mess of it. It's the same thing our father has seen in our lives. Can you get an amen? You saw, we blew our one shot at immortality, and now the graveyards are filling up. But God's not finished with us yet. Psalm 8 verse 4 says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you would care for him or visit him? And it's as if to say, why bother with people like us? We ruined the Garden of Eden. You gave us another chance. We fouled that up so badly, you sent a flood and wiped away mankind all except for one family. Why not just hit the delete button on the human race? Why not just admit that this was an experiment that didn't work out? 
I mean, you gave it a shot, and it just we just keep messing everything up. Why, why, would, why don't you just do that? No one would blame God if he decided to get rid of us. Start all over again. But David's question comes at the very heart of Christmas. What is man that you should pay attention to us? What is man that God should care about us after we failed so miserably? Why should God care about us at all? The New, uh, the new James, uh, the, new, uh, the King James Version says it like this. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? Why would God care enough to visit people like us? If I showed up at your house, it usually means I care about you. If you showed up at mine, it means that you care about me. There's something about, not all the time, but that uh, unique visitation moment showing that you cared. And that's what he did here. It is right at this point that we see the glory and the wonder and the mystery of the gospel. When the writer of Hebrews was trying to impress on the readers the greatness of the salvation that we have, that he actually would quote out of the book of Psalm chapter 8. Let me tell you, Jesus had to become like us in his nature. That's the incarnation. Amen. That's the union of divinity with humanity. That's Bethlehem. That's Christmas. He came into this world as a tiny baby, born in a stable, an obscure village, born in poverty, didn't show up at a palace, didn't show up among the kings, unwanted by the world. He, he was just another face in the crowd. No one seemed to care that he had arrived. Now, now I want you to hear me. Jesus had to do this. Amen. In order to truly visit us, he had to become like us. John 1 tells us about the incarnation. Now, listen, you can read Matthew. He'll talk about the birth of Jesus. He'll throw out the genealogy. You can read uh, the book of Mark. He'll talk about the birth of Jesus. You, you can read the book of, of Luke. Luke won't tell you about the birth of Jesus. Amen. Coming in as a baby. You get to John. John wrote 60 years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He wrote later. Amen. So he said, I'm going to tell you what Christmas is really all about. This is what it's all about. And he said this, so the word became flesh, became human, and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone's coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Hold on, John. Weren't you in Elizabeth's belly while Jesus was in Mary's belly? That only leaves y'all a couple of months apart. But John said, no, uh -uh, I got revelation on my cousin. My cousin was long before I showed up. Why well, thought you showed up first, John? No, 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 no. You're missing it, man. He was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. He became incarnate. What Christmas is all about is God coming from heaven to earth. Amen. It ain't just about a baby born in the stable. It's God himself wrapped himself in an earth suit, hung out here with us, and taught us how to live. Amen. John testified about it. He shouted it out. He was excited about it. He existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after after another. I remind myself, even though I'm older, he my cousin, he came before me, and every blessing I got came from him. The air I breathe, the food I eat, I seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things have been added to me. Mm, preach. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. Pastor David and I talked about this week. Ain't nobody keep the law. You can try. You can become self-righteous and religious. But you can't keep the law. Amen. God put that law out there to try to give people boundaries, and they still screwed up. He said, you know what you need? You need grace and forgiveness. You need so much love toward God that you don't want to sin no more. So he gave great love, and he taught us about grace, and he taught us about mercy. And he says, no one has ever seen God, but, one, but the one and only Son is himself God. And as near to the Father's heart, he has revealed God to us. One of the great tragedies of our day is that people have tried to take the Godhead and make it into a theology in such a way that it became a denomination. They tried to say, well, God is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He's Trinity. Some said, no, he's all three in one. Guys, I, I, I stand back from all of that and tell you, it's a glorious mix-up to me. It's, just, it's so messed up, mixed up. I don't have a brain that can wrap around the Godhead. I can't figure it out, but I can tell you this much. I know his heart, and his heart loves you too much. Amen. Loves you too much to fail you. I understand that God loved you so much. He said, you ain't got to try to figure me out. When has your three-year-old ever looked at you and tried to figure you out? Try to figure out what is it you do. 
Doc Hall, if your, if your kid, if one of your, that red-headed daughter of yours looked at you at age three and said, Dad, what is it you do? And you had a, a plastic glove on up to your shoulder? <laughs> I wouldn't answer that question if I was you. You screwed that girl up for the rest of her life. Amen. No more than any of us can look at God and say, God, what is it you do? Amen. We can't figure out his head, but we understand his heart. He loves us like that. Can I get an amen? In John's gospel, the last five verses here, listen, my friend, when I'm reading through them, they're like a mighty finale of a musical composition played by some great symphony orchestra. We hear the rolling of the drums, the crashing of the cymbals. The Word became human. The Word made a home among us. We hear the rolling drums. Amen. The entire percussion section talking about he came for us. The orchestra comes alive. The fingers of the harpists fly across the strings, and the trumpets blast. In these verses, we we can see the mystery of God has come true as God became flesh and dwelt among us. The great condescension. I remember the first time I said that, how excited Cheryl Malik became because it hit her like a revelation like it did me. To condescend. One thing I can't stand is condescending people and pastors and preachers that act like they better and talk down to people. See, that's condescension. That's the, that's the negative side of condescension. They got more money than you, more athletic than you. They, 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 they got a prettier dog than you. Amen. Their great-grandkids are cuter than yours. You know, they're condescending. That, that kind of statement. To condescend means to lower oneself to a level not normally occupied physically, mentally, or socially. It means to descend voluntarily to the level of another person. And with human beings, this is not always with kindness. Mm -mm. No. You know, I, as a young boy coming up in the country, and, and uh, I did this funeral on Friday, and a guy walked over to me. He said, you, hey, and he just threw it out there. He said, do you have an outhouse? I said, yeah, we had an outhouse. It went a two-holder. He said, yeah, I did. Too. He said, you pick cotton? I said, yeah, I picked cotton. Oh, boy. But if you picked cotton and you had an outhouse, you were condescended upon by people that had indoor plumbing and people that had money. But the older I got, the more of a badge of honor I wore it. Amen. Because I got something you didn't get. See, I got an indoor bathroom too, but you never had an outdoor one. I wear a cotton T-shirt too, but you never got to pick it. You hear me? I flipped flip the script. Amen. So you don't condescend. With every human being, it's not always done with kindness. Some, sometimes there's an air of contempt and snobbery and haughtiness and human condescension. But there's another side of this word. It also means to graciously willing to do something regarded beneath one's dignity. See, not only did God wrap himself in flesh and come to earth, but he served us while he was on earth. He took a towel and wrapped it around himself and condescended and washed the feet of his disciples and taught them to serve one another. Many of us uh, at times, it came to a place that it was too big for us, or, or, or that's, that's something we wouldn't do. I'll tell you, I love this house. I love the church that over the 19 years of the little country church, there have been nothing but servants in this house. Amen. They don't mind bending over and taking a plate or fixing some food or getting somebody a cup of coffee or going and wait on them at the hospital and be kind to them. My friend, that's the kind of condescension we need. Can I get an amen? Amen. To tell yourself, you ain't all that, that you can come down here on all of our level and be a blessing. And that's what he did. This is what God did when he became flesh. It's a mystery. It's a mixture of divine grace and love. He performed the greatest act of condescension of all time. The word that John personified is the very expression and manifestation of God. If I ain't careful, I'm going to run out of voice before I get to New Canaan. The creative power of God <clears throat> was in the word. With such limitless power, the word of God condescended to be compressed in the, to, to take the word. Now, you, 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 don't, you ain't catching it. In the beginning, Genesis, God said, let there be light, and there was light. A day or two later, God said, let there be a sun and a moon. He is the light of the world. He wrapped in swaddling clothes. See, the only light we understand is the moon at night and the sun at day. But before there was a sun and a moon, he said, let there be light. And there was light. And he wrapped himself 
he, all that word, the word that was spoken that created the worlds that we see now, wrapped himself in flesh and came down and dwelt among us. In becoming flesh, he accepted the limitations of humanity. He became vulnerable to those natural human weaknesses that accompany our flesh, hunger, thirst, physical weariness, pain. He experienced the emotional traumas we experience, disappointment, sorrow, hurt, loneliness, and rejection. And later, he understood death. That's what he did when he condescended. While Jesus committed no sin while he was on earth, he became sin for us. When he was in a garden, he cried out, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. He had a tear there. He cried out. He did, he, three times he cried out for it not to happen. Amen. Jesus was not about to succumb to some temptation of sin. It's worse than that. He was about to drink the cup. Let the cup pass. He's fixing to drink the cup that me and you should have drank, the cup of betrayal by Judas and, and, and the cup of desertion by his disciples, the cup of the beating that he's going to take on his back, the dregs, the bitter part of a, of a nasty cup of uh, a Folgers coffee. Amen. He's fixing to hit the bottom of it, man. He said, let it pass from me. Amen. So John said that Jesus lived for a while among us. Literally, that means he pitched his tent. He stayed with it. He cast his lot. He hung out. Jesus tasted death. That, that's our common destiny. Amen. There was one more thing he needed to defeat. Death. It's appointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. Jesus could not have truly visited us if he had held himself back from that last enemy that confronts us. Death. In order to be fully human, he had to taste death. So he suffered and he died because that was the only way that he could save us. So when I stand over the decease of someone that I love, I have stand with confidence and hope that I'm going to see that person again because Jesus died. I'll see the Havards again, but younger, thank God. I'll see people again, amen, uh, because I, that's our hope. He died. He took away the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Jesus came to restore all that had, was lost in the Garden of Eden. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8 says, At present we do not see everything subject to him. Better days are coming, but they aren't here yet. Now, I'm going to say this. Better days are ahead. I've heard preachers, and I've preached it years ago, probably when I was in my 30s, say, Your best is yet to come. I preach out of John chapter 2 about them drinking that wine, amen, and your best is yet to come. Now I'm 61, and I can tell you something. The only best I got waiting for me is in heaven. I love all of y'all, but I think I've about done everything I know I could do. I'm going to still enjoy life to the best of my ability, but a lot of my life is already gone. Amen. I think somewhere you got to quit saying that. Can I get an amen? But let me just tell you about us saints. If you are my age and older, our best is yet to come. It will be in heaven. But there's another flip side to this. The church is not going out in a whimper. But right now, our glory has faded. What God wanted for us has begun to fade. It's precisely at this point of Christmas it speaks so clearly. We were made for glory. We were made for something better. Amen. But we disobeyed. We died inside, then we started dying on the outside, then we turned to our own devices, Romans chapter 1, amen. We decided, God, we don't need you, leave us alone, and we wonder why the world is the way it is, because we've neglected him. We have met the enemy, and he's in us, in a me. It's inside of here. We stare at it every morning, amen. And God said, I will not leave you. I know you'll mess but I ain't leaving you. See, let me just tell you something. Something personal. Some of you have prodigals in your life, people that you love. I don't mean they're bad. It don't mean they're doing all wrong. It just means they're not going to serve God. And I listened to my pastor tell a story this week <coughs> of a church he formerly pastored. He went back there to encourage the new pastor of the church he formerly pastored. I'll tell you this week, I've talked with Kenan Smith of the church I formerly pastored. Amen. I have no problem. We encouraged him to stay the course. Now listen. He said his son, the, man, the pastor's son got wayward and started doing his own thing. He said, and uh, 
the boy, right before he died, came back to Christ. And the daddy's preaching his son's funeral. And I listened to this, and boy, the Holy Ghost jumped all over me about it. He said the dad walked over to the coffin and set a box down. Come on up, Joseph. Set a box down. And he reached inside the box, and he pulled out a robe, and he laid it in the coffin. Then he pulled out a pair of brand-new shoes that was his son's size, and he laid them in the coffin. And he pulled a ring out of the box, and he put it on his son's hand. When he told me that, I know the story, D. It's the story of the prodigal son. That when the prodigal came home, the dad had a robe, he had shoes, because only slaves went without shoes. Put shoes, and he put a ring, signifying inheritance on his hand. And he said, I wasn't able to give this to my boy before he died, but he came back to Jesus, and I want to give it to him now. My God, I heard that story. Pastor David, all I want to do is go get a box. And I'm going to put a, a jacket in it and a pair of shoes and a ring and not say anything to the prodigals in my life, but pray and ask God, don't let this box stay full till the day I die. We've done it before. I told folk in this church, sister, you want a man, lay a pair of pants over, the, your, uh, over your bed and ask God to fill them. We had women do that. And uh, one lady in our church on the campus, she took a T-shirt, laid it over her bed and said, God, fill that T-shirt with a man. I'm, I'm tired of shopping for him. I'm tired of looking for him. Beautiful blonde, two children. She put a T-shirt over her bed and asked God to fill it. I did that wedding two years ago for her and a man. She told me the story. I said, Roxanne, you put a T-shirt over. She said, yes, I did. God filled it with Chris right here. I said, that's good. Let me ask you a question. I said, what did that T-shirt what, what look like? She said, it was a Baylor Bear T-shirt. I looked at Chris. I said, Chris, where'd you get your degree from? He said, Baylor University. Woo. He could have been an Aggie T-shirt, but he chose a Baylor one. He wrapped himself in flesh, walked among us. How could God visit us? This is Christmas. This is what we're celebrating. It ain't about the tree. It ain't about the gifts. It's about God wrapping himself in flesh. C.S. Lewis said, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become the sons of God. God has done it all. With all the good news of Christmas, God did it all. The only thing left for you and me to do is believe. Maybe I could say it's important if it's true. I believe it's true. Amen. You have to decide for your own self. Psalm 8, I read it to you again out of the message. God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle courses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemies' talk and silence atheist babble. I look up at the macro skies, dark and enormous. Your handmade sky, jewelry, moon, stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and I wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Yet we've so narrowly missed being God's, little G. Bright with Eden's dawn light, you put us in charge of your handcraft world. Repeated to us your Genesis charge, which was that, take dominion over the earth. You've made us lords of sheep and cattle, even the animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, well singing in the ocean deep. God, brilliant Lord, your name echoes around the world. This is Christmas. Head bowed, eye closed. Well, my baby jumped when I started talking about the prodigal. If you've got a prodigal, you've got someone you know 
doesn't matter if they're biological or not, but you've been praying that God will bring them back, put them back in the fold, put a Holy Ghost hook in their jaw and bring them back. Amen. And you'll see them serving God. Bet you, would you put your hand up? Could I ask you to keep that hand up? Just hold that hand up. That's all over the building. I do. My hand's up. I'm going I'm to tell you something right now. This preacher's going to get a box, and there's going to be a coat in it, a pair of shoes, and a, and a ring. And I'm going to believe God till it happens. Amen. Hands all over the place. Pray this for me. Lord Jesus, reach my prodigal. Go after my sons and my daughters, my friends' sons and daughters. I'm believing that the year of 2023, I'm going to get to use that box. I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus for wrapping yourself in flesh. Come in here and be in my Lord and my Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in this house.